today being Resurrection Sunday, allow me to lead you into a passage of scripture taken out of the book of Revelation. If you have your Bibles, come with me to chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, verse 18, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. What a glorious statement from Jesus. This was given to John when he was on the island of Patmos, a place that I've been there many times, where Jesus was showing himself alive, not only just for now, but forevermore. And that's what you and I have come to celebrate today. The Jesus who is not just alive, but alive forevermore. Yesterday evening, I shared a message on Passover and the nation of Israel. This morning at 9, I shared another message, Passover and the church. And today in the final service, I plan to share on the topic, Passover and the nations. See, that term, Passover, is like a balloon. It all depends how big you want to blow the balloon out. For some, they are happy with a balloon this big. For others, they want a balloon a little bigger. And for others, they want the full extent of the balloon. So that word Passover can come to us as something this small, this big, something very big. So at this level, it's what Passover means to you and I. At the bigger level, it's what it means to the nation of Israel. But at the biggest level, Passover has serious ramifications for the nations. Have you ever wondered as a Christian, why when we come to the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, or for that matter, the Gospels, the Gospels are filled with names after names after names after names. Mary and Joseph, Zacharias and Elizabeth, Simeon and Anna, Zacchaeus, Nicodemus, Bartimaeus, and the name goes on and on and on and on. There are just so many names filled in the first part of the New Testament. But when you and I come to the last part of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, you'll not find a single name there except for the name John. Ever wondered why? Why is it that names, characters who are alive, do not appear in the book of Revelation? Ever ask yourself why? The answer is because the Jesus who came the first time in the Gospels is coming to finish what he started when he comes the second time. He comes the second time to finish what he started. As Christians, you and I have been given reasons to believe that what Jesus did on the cross was the final act. When Jesus said, it is finished, we as Christians believe that all that needed to be done was done on the cross. Now, if that was true, then why must he come back a second time? As Christians, you and I need to ask ourselves this question. If all that needed to be done was done on the cross, then why must Jesus come back a second time? So the Bible has to inform us as to what Jesus meant by that then and there and why Jesus needs to come back a second time. And so, allow me to answer my own question. In the book of Revelation, there are no names like in the Gospels. And the answer, the Jesus who came in the Gospels came as a savior for the souls of mankind but the Jesus who comes back the second time in the book of Revelation is coming back as the King of Kings and as the Lord of Lords. As Savior, his primary concern in the Gospels was the souls of mankind. But as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords in the book of Revelation coming back the second time, his primary concern are nations. Savior equals souls. King equals nations. Take any king. What must be his primary priority, primary preoccupation? Nations. Any king 
must be primarily concerned about his nation. A prime minister, primary concern, nation. President, primary concern, nation. King, primary concern, nation. And because Jesus is not just coming back as king, but king of kings, his concerns are nations. Let's just assume a new Christian walks up to you and you are a seasoned Christian. And if the new Christian pops a question to you, can you please explain to me what Jesus' short-term plans are and what Jesus' long-term plans are? How would you explain that to them? How would you explain to this new Christian, how would you answer this new Christian to a question, what are Jesus' short-term plans and what are Jesus' long-term plans? How would you answer that? Now, most of us have not been taught or trained to answer that question. I was not taught or trained to answer that question either. I stumbled into it. I picked up my doctorate in 1991. It was seven years after, after having picked up my doctoral degree, I had an encounter with the Lord in the island of Patmos. And that's when I had a revelation of what his short-term plans are and his long-term plans are. And since that time, I've given myself exclusively, extensively, to pursue that short-term plans and Jesus' long-term plans. So let me try to unpack that for you here. What are his short-term plans? Between now and his second coming, whatever happens between now and his second coming, we call that his end-time plans, short-term and time plans. Whatever happens after Jesus returns, and he returns in Revelation 19, whatever happens after he returns are his long-term plans. To put it another way, end time plans, eternal purposes. Short-term, long-term, end time plans, eternal purposes. So with this as the overarching picture of the Bible, this is not a man's idea, this is God's idea. Let's do something. Let's begin with the end in mind and work backwards. Because of where we are today and we are consumed with a ton of problems, including COVID. People like you and I are so consumed with today, we can't really see clearly what tomorrow brings, or even more so the day after because we are preoccupied with what's happening here. Which is why it is always wise to begin with the end in mind and work backwards. So when we come to the end of the book of Revelation, now I know that Pastor Gibson and Pastor Song will be teaching you the book of Revelation, so I'll not be taking anything out. But what I intend to do is simply to connect Passover and the nations with you this morning. So when you come to the tail end of the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation comes to us in 22 chapters. If you count all the number of verses in the, in the book, there are 404 verses, 404. Um, I've studied the book of Revelation over 150 times, which is why I wrote that book, following my encounter with Jesus in the island of Patmos. So when you come to the tail end, in other words, when the story ends, and that's one thing that I've learned to help myself understand. Our scholar friends from the West call this the end times. I prefer to call end of the story because the Bible is a story. The Bible is not just a story, the Bible is a single story and because the Bible is a story, a single story, it has a single end. And the moment you discount the fact the Bible is a story and you treat the Bible as a series of subjects, you end up with several multiple options when it comes to the end, which is a predicament, unfortunately, within Christian circles. Christians read the same Bible and yet cannot come to the same conclusion as to when Jesus is returning. We cannot. There are different versions of when Jesus, some believe before, some believe during, some believe after, some believe between the middle and before the after. Four different versions. How is that possible that when you are and I are reading the same Bible and yet we come up to four different conclusions? That baffled me. 
It's following that encounter with Jesus and things began to make sense. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over an extended period of years. When I began to understand through the reading of the Bible over and over again, especially the book of Revelation, help me understand, Lord, help me understand. I want to know how the story ends. Now I want to know what's my part in your story. That's the part that we call destiny. You see, the reason why most Christians are unaware of their God-given destinies is because they have been detached from the story of the Bible. The Bible has been made to come across to you and I as a series of subjects. When we went to seminary, ask Pastor Song, he will tell you this. What we were taught about the Bible was soteriology, pneumatology, ecclesiology, eschatology, hematology, all the logis. They divided the Bible into a series of subjects, and that's how they presented the Bible to us, as a series of subjects. The Bible was never meant to be a series of subjects. It's a story, a single story, and therefore with a single end. Once you and I subscribe to that biblical idea, Bible is a story, a single story with a single end, then all the confusion dissipates. There cannot be four different versions on the coming of Christ. There can only be one. A story cannot have four endings, can only be one ending. And therefore, once you come to terms with this, you start with the, back, the, the, the end in mind and work backwards. So when we come to Revelation 21, 22, the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, what do you find there? I am assuming that you have read the book of Revelation. If not, please do. For your information, of all the books in the Bible, all the books in the Bible are inspired, in, inerrant, and infallible. But there's only one book in the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read, hear, and obey. Revelation 1-3, the book of Revelation. Now, because there is an express statement that those who read, hear, and obey this book stand to be blessed, I gave myself to read it 150 times. Why not? It says... And guess what? My life has been a blast. I had this encounter in Patmos in 1998. My life has never been the same since. I understand what the writer was trying to say. This book has the potent power to bless you like nothing else. I am a living testimony of that. So when you come to the tail end of the book of Revelation 21 and 22, what do you find? You find an interesting scenario. Heaven has already come down. Now this is a shocker for most Christians because we have been told all our lives as Christians that when we die, we go up. Yes, if you plan to die today, you go up. But in Revelation 21, heaven comes down and blends with earth and heaven and earth becomes one. And it is then called new heaven, new earth. Now think about that. We think that we are going to spend all eternity up there. The Bible says, no, you and I are spending all eternity down here. I've always imagined myself at rapture, no, going up this way, going to meet Jesus, and Jesus is coming down this way. And I'm meeting Jesus halfway. Hey, Jesus, where are you going? I said, I'm going up to meet you. And he says, I'm going down to meet you. <laughs> oh, we have a serious conflict of interest here. But like you, I was told that my eternal future is out there. But the Bible says that my eternal future is down here. And the startling thing that you find as a story ends, it's the end of the story, Revelation 21, 22, there's nothing after that. So when the story ends, you find a remarkable statement in the word of God. Revelation 21, verse 24, Revelation 21, verse 26, Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. You find something staggering and it baffles you as a Christian because this is heaven New heaven, new earth, and you find not only you and I, people whose names have been inscribed in the Lamb's book of life, but instead you find nations there. I was never taught seven years in seminary, never once was I taught that nations also inherit heaven. Nobody ever told me that. Why not? It's in the Bible. 
Check this out for yourself. Don't take what I say. Be like the Berians. Check me out. Revelation 21, 24, Revelation 21, 26, Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Check me out. Go home. Check me out. And then, when I discovered after reading, the, and my question was, Jesus, what are the nations doing in heaven? What in the world are nations doing in heaven? Because my theology had no room for that. I was raised and I was tutored seven years in seminary only to believe that you and I, people whose name have been inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life, we inherit heaven. What are the nations doing there? And then I started to read the rest of Revelation. So Jesus returns in Revelation 19. So hear me well now, please, because what happens on the other side for you will be determined by what you do with your life on this side. Let me repeat that. What happens to you and I on the other side will be determined by what you and I do on this side, meaning now. So listen carefully. So Jesus returns in Revelation 19 as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. First, listen carefully, he becomes the King of Israel. That's his prophesied destiny. He becomes the King of Israel. When the wise men from the east came looking for Jesus, they did not come looking for a savior. They came looking for a king. When Jesus died and was nailed on the cross, the sign above his head did not say, here lies the savior of the world, but the king of the Jews. So Jesus has a primary destiny to fulfill, to first become the king of Israel. Remember David, king of all Israel? He's the son of David, king of all Israel. Now after he has become king of all Israel, Revelation 19, then comes Revelation 20. Revelation 20 is that chapter that captures the millennial rule of Christ, that the time when Jesus will rule the earth for a thousand years, a thousand years. Now ever ask yourself this question, so what exactly will Jesus do in those thousand years? What will he do? <sighs> Tragically, seven years in seminary, nobody answered that question for me. None. But it's the all important question. So what will Jesus do in those thousand years? And the answer? He repairs nations. He restores nations. He releases nations to their God-given destiny. Let me repeat that again. He repairs nations. He restores nations. And he releases nations to their God-given destiny. And while I was in Bible school, I was told that at the Battle of Armageddon, all nations will come against Jesus, Jerusalem, and the Jewish people. And I believe that. I believe that because there's a verse that appears to imply that. But then, the Bible writers, when they say all, sometimes they don't mean all. The technical word we use is the word hyperbole. Hyperbole comes from the word hype. So for emphasis, for reasons of emphasis, they blow up to reinforce a certain statement. All. Not all in the Bible all the time means all. For instance, Acts chapter 2 and verse 5. Luke writes the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 5. Every nation under heaven had gathered in Jerusalem. Every nation in heaven had gathered under Jerusalem. Now every in English means every. Every means every. But when you start reading the rest of chapter 2, you count. There are only 14 nations lifted. 14 nations are listed there. And why would Luke say every nation? That's just his way of describing the Roman Empire. Every nation within the Roman Empire were present there. 
because those 40 nations were part of the Roman Empire, first century AD. We understand that. So language always does not mean the same thing. The context must determine that. So here, I was raised with the idea that all nations will come against Jesus, all nations will come against Jerusalem, all nations will come against the Jewish people at the Battle of Armageddon. So my big question was, will Singapore come against Jesus? Will my Singapore come against Jerusalem? Will my Singapore come against the Jewish people? And I said, no, not in my watch. And then when you read the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, there you find something else. Where Zechariah makes a solid statement, the nations that did not come against Jesus, the nation that did not come against Jerusalem, the nation that did not come against the Jewish people, they inherit the millennial rule. If there are no nation, because according to Revelation 19, those nations that come marching against Jesus, Jerusalem, and the Jewish people are wiped out clean, annihilated, nothing is left. They are exterminated by Jesus. He destroys them by the sword that comes out from his mouth. Nothing is left. The scavengers come and finish whatever is left. So if all nations perish at the battle of Armageddon, then when Jesus is coming back as king of kings, what nation is he supposed to rule? Think. There are no nations to rule. Thank God for Zechariah. He says, not all nations will come against Jesus, not all nations will march against the Jewish people, not all nations will march against Jerusalem. And I say, thank you, Lord. May Singapore be amongst them. May Singapore never march against Jesus. May Singapore never declare war with Jerusalem. May Singapore never declare war with the Jewish people. Thank God for the relationship we have with Israel. So that is what happens in those thousand years in Revelation 20. Revelation 20. But in order for the nations to be repaired, in order for the nation to be restored, in order for the nation to be released into their God-given destiny, Israel must come into his destiny first. Which is why Jesus returns back to Israel in Revelation 19. Why? Why is Israel the key to unlock the destinies of the nation? Because Israel is the firstborn son. Not according to man, according to God. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22 categorically insists where God says to Moses, go stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. So by virtue of being the firstborn son of God, Israel must come into his destiny before the other son, before the other nation can come into their God-given destiny. So which is what happens in Revelation 19. And I have an interesting verse to, to read for you. I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew and reading from chapter 26. I'm sure you have heard this before, but never entered. Matthew 26 and verse 29. Listen to this. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with new with you in my Father's kingdom. So what in the world was Jesus saying? This was in the upper room where Jesus was taking part in the, what we call the Lord's Supper. Just before he died, this is the Lord's Supper. And in giving out the elements, he says this, henceforth, I will not take part of this until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. In other words, after having participated in the Passover, then Jesus says, I will not partake of this Passover meal with you until we come into my father's kingdom. So there's a future Passover. There's a future Passover. And in that future Passover, Jesus this, does something remarkable. Come with me to Revelation chapter 12. And here we go. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10, 11. And allow me to read this. 
And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now, as Christians, we have taken this verse for ourselves a thousand times before. You have, I have, we have. That's fine. By extension, we do qualify to be a blessing, take a blessing. But within context, this verse was meant for Israel. Not the church, Israel. By extension, the church. But context, Israel. How do I know that? Chapter 12, verse 1. Same chapter, chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1 is a, a clear indication that we're speaking about Israel. So there comes a moment in time in the future, not yet, soon, wash my hand, where we are now, 2021, there's coming a day in the future when all Israel will be saved. We know this not just because it's a good idea, it's God's idea. We know from Isaiah chapter 59 verses 20, 21. We know from the New Testament, Romans chapter 11 verses 25, 26, that God has guaranteed the salvation of national Israel. All Israel will be saved, not maybe saved. Not all Israel, I hope, will be saved. All Israel will be saved. Once in the Old Testament and next in the New Testament. God has guaranteed the salvation. But why does God guarantee the salvation of Israel? Because if the nation of Israel does not come into salvation, it cannot come into its destiny. And if nation of Israel cannot come into its destiny, then the nations cannot come into their destiny. That's the logic of scripture. Which is why, as the story works backward, before the nations can come into their destiny, Israel has to come into their destiny. So Revelation 19, Jesus returns to Israel. And in Revelation 12, we have a statement in heaven that all Israel will be saved. And so now we backtrack further. So we have the nations at the tail end. The story ends with the nations all praising and worshiping God. So Revelation 5, 12, Revelation 7, 9, every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. We don't have names, no Nicodemus, no Zacchaeus, no Bartimaeus, no Joseph. But instead of names, we have every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation. Jesus is coming back to redeem, to restore, and to release the nations into their God-given destiny. So before the nations can be released into your destiny, Israel must come into salvation and be released into her destiny. So what is Israel's destiny? According to Genesis 22 and verse 18, the Bible categorically insists that Israel has been created for one reason and one reason only, to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Check it out. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, Israel has been created by God exclusively for one reason and one reason only, that she can be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. What did Jesus mean by that? What does the Bible mean by that? That when Israel comes into her salvation, that Israel comes into her God-given destiny, then she'll be able to bring all other nations into her God-given destiny. See, Israel, according to Isaiah 42 and verse 6, and then Isaiah 49 and verse 6, the prophet says Israel is like a lighthouse shining light to the nations. What does the lighthouse do? We used to have lighthouses in Singapore a long time ago. Now I don't know if we have any, but there was a time when we had lighthouses and they're always on a hilltop. People have to see, the sailors will have to see. You cannot be in a valley, it has to be on a hilltop. And there the lighthouse goes like this, 360 degrees. What's the purpose? to radiate light to the ships that are coming into treacherous waters to give them direction, which way to go, which way not to go. 
And that was the original purpose of God creating Israel to be a lighthouse. Now, did you know that Jerusalem, Israel, is in the center of the earth? Did you know that? How did I know that? Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5. There the verse categorically says that God created the nations and Israel in the center. Why is Israel in the center? Why can't Israel be somewhere west, can't be somewhere? What's wrong with that? No, because Israel represents the throne of God. Jeremiah 3 and verse 17, Jerusalem is the throne of God. And the throne of God has to be in the center. And so as Israel, as a lighthouse, is in the center. And Israel, if you know anything about Jesus, is coming to rule and reign on Mount Zion. And that's a mountain. So Israel's lighthouse is perched on a mountain, Mount Zion, and there it radiates light, 360 degrees to all the nations, north, south, east, west. And when they see this light emanating out of the lighthouse, the nations are guided to come into their God-given destiny. Without Israel, darkness, utter darkness. And without a lighthouse, sailors, back in the former centuries, would testify is disaster, disaster. So as we are coming to understand the vital role that Israel must play in the end times, the Israel coming into its destiny now brings the nations into its destiny. Now we backtrack further. So 21, 22 nations, 20 nations, 19, Israel returns, and then you look beyond, Revelation 18. So what happens in Revelation 18? In Revelation 18, Jesus does something remarkable. He destroys Babylon. Once and for all, he destroys Babylon. Now, Babylon is that entity that belongs to Satan and to the Antichrist. Babylon has been called the whore, W-H-O-R-E, whore, the prostitute. Because Jesus Christ has a bride, the Antichrist has a bride. The bride of Jesus Christ is called the church, and the bride of the Antichrist is called Babylon, the whore. While the function of the bride of Christ is to purify the nations, the function of Babylon is to corrupt the nations. And that's what Babylon does. So what does Jesus do before he returns? Destroy Babylon. Because if Babylon is allowed to live, then when he returns and he begins his 1,000-year millennial reign, Babylon will corrupt the nations yet once again. So Jesus takes Babylon out. And then when he arrives, after having defeated the false prophet and the antichrist and casting them into the lake of fire, he binds Satan for a thousand years. Why? He does not want Satan to interfere in his agenda for a thousand years. Jesus wants to repair, restore, and release the nations into their God-given destiny. He cannot afford to have Satan still roaming around. Bind him in the prison for a thousand years. We need to understand the big picture of the Bible. So we come further now. So we have Revelation 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 12, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. That's where we are now, in Revelation 6. Thus far, I've spoken to you about the nations, and I've spoken to you about the nation of Israel. Now allow me to speak to you about the first entity, Church. This is our story. So I call this CNN. What does CNN stand for? Not Cable News Network. Church, Nation of Israel, Nations of the World. CNN. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. I like to keep things simple. So what's the book of Revelation all about? CNN. So we come to the church. Israel is not yet saved. Will be saved. But not yet. What is Jesus waiting for? He's waiting for the church. 
the church. According to the book of Revelation, and according to the book of Romans chapter 11, it is up to you and I, the Gentiles who are part of the church, you and I have been given the mandate to bring all Israel into salvation. All Israel into salvation. That's your mission, my mission. As Christians, you and I have been taught all our lives that Jesus is coming back. And yes, that's our blessed hope. But there's a catch here. A catch. And the catch is this. Who is authorized to invite him back to earth? Who has been given the protocol to bring Jesus back to earth? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Now, as Singaporeans, from time to time, we either attend live National Day uh, Parade, either Padang or somewhere else, or we watch on TV. So when the president comes in, in his whatever, not in his scooter, he comes, I don't know what he comes in. So whatever he comes in, there is a man appointed by the government who has been given the protocol to walk up to the president's car, open his door, and usher the president to his seat. <laughs> you and I can't just say, hey, hi, can I, can I come in? And you can't do that. You and I have not been given the protocol to do that. Only people who are authorized, anointed can do that. I'm not. So likewise, when Jesus is coming back to earth, only one nation has been given the protocol, the mandate to invite him back. Which nation? Not Singapore. The Bible says Israel. Now, this may be hard for us as Christians to understand, but this is what the Bible says. The first time Jesus came, it was Israel who brought him to earth. And the second time he comes, it is Israel who brings him back to earth. Now, Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 39, where Jesus categorically says in chapter 23, Matthew 23 verse 39, unless you say, Baruch haba Besha Madonai, I'm not coming back. Unless you invite me back, I'm not coming back. The you here are the Jewish people. So Israel has been given the divine protocol to invite Jesus back. So we have a problem as Christians. We want Jesus to come back. You want him to come back. I want him to come back. But he cannot come back until Israel invites him. But Israel is not ready to invite him. Why not? Because Israel is not saved. Israel can only invite him after they are saved. But Israel is not saved. So I have a job to do. This is a job for George Anadorai. Ah. To get Israel saved. Why? Firstly, because I'm part of the church. But secondly, because I'm part of Singapore. Singapore has a unique responsibility towards Israel. All nations have responsibilities towards Israel. But Singapore has a unique responsibility towards Israel. Look at our history. Our history is filled with the fingerprints of God. Like all fingerprints, the naked eye cannot see a fingerprint. It takes a special lens to be able to see the fingerprints all over. That's what they do in CSI. The naked eye does not allow us to see the fingerprints of God over the history of Singapore. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to be your lens and allow, ask him, show me the fingerprints of God in the history of Singapore, you'll find his fingerprints all over. All over. For starters, our position. There was a time when I lamented before God. I literally lamented before God. I said, Malaysia has oil under its ground. Indonesia has oil under its ground. South Africa has diamonds in its ground. Australia has minerals under its ground. China has minerals under its ground. Singapore has earthworms under its ground. Ever thought about that? I said, what happened, Lord? I thought according to Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8, every nation has an inheritance. I can see these nations have been given an inheritance by you. I mean, what's below the soil was not planted there by men. It's planted by God. Well, what about Singapore? Why have you bypassed Singapore? And I actually cried before the Lord. And the Lord said, but I've given you a very unique destiny. What? 
earthworms touching? And that the Lord said, did you ever take time to consider that I've given you your unique position? You are where you are because I placed you there and because of where you are, you are what you are today. Wow, that was a mind-blowing moment. Now, we measure 42 kilometers east to west and 20 kilometers north to south. We are a speck on the world's map. You can see the word Singapore, can't see Singapore. You know what I mean, right? We are that big. He could have simply tossed us anywhere into the air and make us fall somewhere in the Pacific Ocean and be an island unknown to mankind. But he carefully placed us on that part of the ocean, the South China Sea, making sure that all the ships going West going east have to pass, pass by Singapore and all the ships from east going west have to pass by Singapore and that's what we are. Our geographical position is our God-given destiny. Everything we are today is by virtue of our positioning. And I like to say this, men cannot take credit for that. Lee Kuan, you cannot take credit. I place Singapore right here at the South China Sea. That was God. God alone takes that credit. So because I belong to Singapore and because I'm part of the church, I have now come to understand that the nations cannot come into their God-given destiny until and unless Israel comes into its God-given destiny. And Israel cannot come into its God-given destiny until it comes into salvation. It all depends now on the church. So we are the ones that make us all the difference. To we are the domino card. The church is the domino card. The church knocks Israel. Israel knocks the nations. We are the domino card. And you and I have a divine responsibility to bring Israel to salvation. To finish. To land the plane. The story comes one full circle. First century AD. The Gentiles came to hear of the good news of the gospel through a Jewish man called Paul, Saul. Through the Jewish man, the Gentile world came to hear of the good news of the gospel. Fast forward 2,000 years. Now we are in the 21st century. Much of the Gentile world has come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But Israel has forgotten who their Lord and Savior, who their Messiah is, who is going to bring the gospel to them. One full circle. It's now up to you and I. It's now up to you and I to bring the gospel back to Israel. Israel desperately needs. This week, Israel celebrated Passover. But you know what's the irony of their Passover? They are still celebrating Passover, not realizing that the Passover lamb has already come. The Passover lamb has already been sacrificed and that salvation has already been extended. They don't know that. They don't know that. So someone from this side has to go that side and preach the gospel. So I live my life with the short-term plans of Jesus in mind, the end-time plan, bringing Israel into salvation, short-term plan, long-term plan, all nations coming into their destiny. Short-term plan to bring Israel through the church into a salvation and destiny. Long-term plan through Israel and the church to bring all nations into their destiny. I'm answering my own question that I raised at the start of this presentation. CNN, church, nation of Israel, nations of the world. Let's rise. Now, before you close your eyes, allow me to make one final statement. So please listen very carefully. You and I will be very alive when Jesus comes to 
ruled a thousand years. The one thousand years. Jesus, when he returns and rules the nations of the earth for a thousand years as king of kings and as lord of lords, you and I will be very alive during that time. And you and I will be very alive with Jesus during those thousand years. Here's the question. What will you be doing in those thousand years? What will you be doing? Now, forget about getting a white gown that goes all the way down to your toes. And in my case, uh, XXL. And then, you know, we're given a net and then we fly through space catching butterflies for the rest of our lives. That's not going to happen. That's a myth. Reality is, you and I are going to be with Jesus here on earth for a thousand years. And his agenda are nations. Let's understand the agenda are nations. So what will you and I do when we cross over on that side? In our transformed bodies, we no longer die. We are already in our transformed bodies on the other side. What will you and I do? What will be our job description? The answer depends on what you're doing now. What are you doing now will determine what your job description will be on the other side. Remember the parable of the talents. You have gained five plus the five. Now, inherit the cities. Inherit the cities. Why inherit the cities? Because that's our function in the millennial rule to transform nations. So meaning that right now, you and I have a divine role and responsibility to bring transformation to the nation of Israel. Your church is neck deep in Israel. Church of Singapore, Bukit Timah is neck deep in Israel. They have partnered together with me and my ministry in Israel many a times. Sowing hundreds and thousands of dollars, your money, into the soil of Israel. For what purpose? To bring all Israel to salvation. Thank you for doing that, Church of Singapore, Bukit Timah. Now I pray that you'll do it a lot more and a lot more often. Continue doing that because that's our calling. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for declaring your short-term plans and your long-term plans to us, Lord. And for those of us who are hearing this for the first time, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will allow revelation to come through and allow this word to find a resting place in their hearts and minds and allowing them, Lord, to align their lives and ministry according to your short-term plans and according to your long-term plans, according to your end-time plans and according to your eternal purposes. So, Father, I pray and I thank you, Lord, for Church of Singapore, Bukitima, for they have given themselves extensively and exclusively not only to be a blessing to Singapore, not only to be a blessing in Asia, but to be a blessing to Israel. I am a witness of that, Lord. So as I lift up this church before you, I ask of you to allow this church to come into their God-given destiny. Allow Church of Singapore, Bukit Timah to come into its God-given destiny. Allow the Church of Singapore, Bukit Timah to come into its God-given destiny. And when the church come into his God-given destiny, every member in the church comes into their God-given destiny. As the Chinese say, when the waters rise, all the boats on the water rise as well. When the church rises, all the members in the church also rise as well. So thank you, Father. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, family. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. 也希望所有在线上聆听的观众都会因此蒙福。如果您是第一次观看我们新加坡教会五级之马的视频，我们欢迎你。我们也热烈的邀请您来到我们的教会参加我们的实体聚会，就在每周六的傍晚五点和星期天早上的九点和十一点。您只需在每周一晚上八点来到我们的网页索取入场券，或是扫描我们屏幕上的二维码和说明框中点击连接。我们祝福你有个美好的一周，我们教会见。